third year students here our new lecture in poetry uh, of course we uh, as you know we have reached to our last poet concerning the romantic period George Gordon his name is George Gordon but he is mostly uh, referred to as Lord Byron he has this title Lord uh, and he is mostly known by this no uh, sorry name more than with his uh, name George Gordon okay so Lord Byron and here you see his image uh, we are not going to study the poem in this lecture we are just going to have a brief idea about uh, something some concept which is related to the poem also so before we start with the poem we should have a brief idea about uh, this concept uh, and at the same time we should know something about Lord Byron's life so that we can relate all this information to uh, the analysis of our poem so, what are these concepts that we need to consider? First of all, because we are studying the Romantic period, the Romantic poetry, in general, Romantic literature, there is a concept which is called the Romantic hero. What do we mean by Romantic hero? Let's see here some details about this concept. The traditional Romantic heroes, and why do we say here traditional? Because uh, as we are going to move to the Byronic hero, uh, we will see that the Byronic hero is a, a kind of a romantic hero. That's why uh, the, the well-known romantic hero is considered a traditional one con uh, compared to the Byronic hero. Traditional romantic heroes tend to be defined by their rejection or questioning of standard social convention, uh, sorry, conventions and norms of behavior. What does this mean? It means that a Byronic, uh, sorry, a traditional romantic hero uh, would not accept to obey the traditional, let's say, rules of society. Like what? Like, for example, the traditional uh, rules concerning marriage, for example, relationships. Um, the romantic hero sometimes even reject uh, the standards, the let's say the social, the moral standards of society. Uh, they would go against the normal ways of behaving. Uh, that's why, for example, one of the things that are well known about a uh, romantic hero, for example, is that um, uh, they, they tend to isolate themselves from society. They don't want to live according to the rules or ways of society. So their alienation from larger society, you see, their alienation from larger society. Uh, the, the romantic poets that we studied uh, previously, uh, one of the things that you might uh, heard, maybe, uh, or maybe you haven't mentioned, I'm not... Uh, clearly sure about this uh, but one of the things that they called for was to leave uh, the life in the city and go and live somewhere in nature they, they, they even had some kind of uh, call for that I mean they called people to do that they believed that uh, the best way for people in order to uh, let's say to go back to that primary state of purity and to uh, uh, let's say reflect upon their own individual uh, identities is to go back to nature to live in nature so they called uh, people to what to leave the city and go back to live in nature you see so they had some some kind of extremity uh, in their calls their focus on the self as the center of existence and you see this is uh, this is what makes them uh, strange to society. Why? Because usually in, in the previous, uh, let's say, ages, uh, a poet or a writer or someone who's well known in society, they are required to call people to what? To do something which is related to the whole society. As an individual, your value as an individual is determined by what you give to society, what you do for society, not 
uh, by uh, the expression of your own self. You as an individual, what you think, what you feel is not important by itself. It is important as much as it is related to your own larger society. But when the romantic, uh, let's say, writers, poets uh, came, they they saw that this is not right. We have to also focus on the self. Each person, each individual is worthy by himself. It is not something uh, that is determined by the society. No, each person has his own worth and his own uh, value. Their ability to inspire others to commit acts of good and kindness. So they, they of course, such such people inspire others. They, uh, they are like a role model, like an example to people so they, that they follow them uh, in what they do. And usually the, ro the romantic hero, he's not rejecting or questioning or against the values of society because he wants to do something uh, evil or dangerous or bad. He's doing that in order to gain freedom, in order to spread, let's say, uh, equality in order to uh, show people that each each person each individual should be respected uh, regardless of whether they do something for society or not uh, actually their revolution their rejection of society or the social conventions was to do something good imperfect and often flawed individuals who often behave in a heroic manner so uh, the romantic heroes are usually what? Imperfect. What does this mean, imperfect? It means that they, they do mistakes. Of course, they are human beings after all. They are not uh, to be regarded as, uh, let's say, saints or angels. They are imperfect. They, they have done something wrong. Uh, they are flawed people, but still they do what heroic things heroic they, they act in heroic manner they do good things i think you can remember uh, or maybe one of the things that uh, we are reminded of when we speak about such characters is the character of robin hood uh, all of us know this story of robin hood the the hero who steal from the wealthy people in order to give the poor so you see the, he, he does something wrong but uh, he's considered to be a very good example of such a uh, romantic hero who, who rejects or who behaves against the standards of society, but at the same time, what does he do? He's doing that in order to do heroic things, heroic, or he acts in a heroic manner. This is the traditional romantic hero. You see, the romantic hero. Now, we have something else, which is also related to the romantic hero, or he's kind of a romantic hero which is called byronic hero of course it comes from where from lord byron why do we have a specific kind of hero which is named after lord byron alone this is of course uh, for a reason lord byron uh, of course it is something that byron himself didn't call his hero byronic of course this is something that the critics later did critics writers historians as they studied lord byron's life and his poetry they analyzed uh, the characters of his poetry in a way that they came up with this concept the byronic hero lord byron developed the archetype of the byronic hero in response to his boredom with traditional and romantic heroic literary characters so lord byron didn't actually approve uh, of the traditional romantic hero. He didn't see that he, uh, of course, we said the, the Byronic hero uh, shows rejection, uh, he's rebellious, he revolts against the society and its values and standards, but uh, for Lord Byron, it wasn't enough. There has to be something more. He wants to take the romantic hero to some larger let's say uh, level some something more extreme so he wanted to introduce a heroic archetype that would be not only more appealing to readers but also more psychologically realistic so he tries to do what to add some psychological complexity 
some psychological dimensions to this hero, not typical hero who does things uh, against society. No, he, he takes uh, his actions to the most extreme level. There is, and, and of course, this is based on what? Not just to defy society or challenge society. No, there is some kind of psychological explanation for that. Remarkable intelligence. So what are the characteristics of a Byronic hero? Of course, he's intelligent and cunning. You see, cunning. There is some kind of uh, cunning nature. Cunning, cunning. Strong feelings of affection and hatred. So he, when he loves something, he loves it extremely with strong feelings. If he hates something, then he also hates it extremely. He's always uh, taking his feelings to the extreme. Impulsiveness, which means that uh, impulsiveness, uh, it means that uh, he, he always has this passion towards things always strongly motivated you see sometimes he does things out of uh, sudden feeling or uh, emotion strong sensual desires of, of course he, when he takes his feelings and uh, emotions to the most extreme he also takes his own sensual desires even the materialistic part of him uh, of his uh, personality he also takes it to the extreme and this is one of the notorious function notorious notorious yani and you can show us mashhur bi ashya sayya aks famous famous mashhur bi shi ijabi notorious mashhur li ashya salbiya and this is one of the things that the ironic heroes are notorious for actually the sensual desires moodiness you see moodiness uh, at one time he's in a certain mood, suddenly he flips to another mood. Cynicism. Okay, he he view things or he takes things uh, with a sense of what? Of, of sarcasm, cynicism, irony. Dark humor. Comedia Sauda, dark humor. So uh, of course, you are familiar with these uh, with these terms. Uh, although he's humorous, but this uh, humor hides something behind it. And morbid sensibilities. Okay. This is concerning his character. Let's say his personality. So you see, each characteristic which is related to the romantic hero. What does the Byronic hero does? He takes it to the most extreme level. He takes it a level higher than the usual. Dress and the style themselves, the Byronic heroes, they dress and style themselves in elaborate costumes for the purpose of making themselves as different from others as possible. See and look at the picture of Lord Byron here. You see how he dresses? He's, have you ever seen an English poet, character, person who wears like this, this is, a, this is a turban. Where do we see such turbans? We see it in, in, uh, in the East. Uh, maybe in our uh, Arabic culture, we have such clothes. This also, I think this is a sword or a dagger. I'm not sure, but have you ever seen English people wear like this? Of course not, because this is not a Western way of clothing. This is Oriental, this is Eastern. This is actually, and more specifically, this is Turkish. You see, um, the, the, the Romantics, if you remember, we said the Romantics were very uh, interested in the Orient, in the East, in those faraway places. They had such dreamy, uh, romantic ideas about these places. And uh, Lord Byron actually was one of those who took this interest to the extreme. You remember, we said, Everything is extreme here. So uh, he took this to the extreme, to the extent that he was wearing clothes which are very uh, strange to his Western culture and Western society, like this one. So imagine, in, in his society, in the English society, he would walk wearing like this. Uh, or uh, he was uh, 
asking some painter to paint him wearing these clothes. So you see, they take everything to the most extreme in order to show how different they are. Okay, so when we make a comparison, you see, so I want you to consider these two slides here that they are comparison between the Byronic hero and the Romantic hero. So when we compare two things, uh, we you, you have to pay attention to this. Whenever you make a comparison between two things, you say the differences and you say the similarities. So these are differences, we can say. What about the similarities? Actually, ju just one similarity. And when we speak about similarities, we say both. We use this word. Both romantic and Byronic heroes tend to rebel against conventional modes of behavior and thought and possess personalities that are not traditionally heroic. Okay, so this is the only thing that is similar between these two uh, types of heroes, that they both are, what, rebellious. They uh, reject the conventional modes of behavior in society. Just one similarity between them. Okay. Now, let's see. M maybe you would like to know examples uh, of Byronic heroes. Most literary scholars and historians consider the first literary Byronic hero to be Byron's child Harold, the protagonist of Byron's epic poem, Child Harold's Pilgrimage. So uh, this work by, by Byron, this main character, some say that this is the first example. Of course, there are many in, uh, in literature. Later on, when we try to analyze, we can see that many critics have actually named other characters. Like, for example, uh, I think you are studying this year, you study Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte. Heathcliff, the character of Heathcliff. Some consider that Heathcliff is a very good example of the Byronic hero. And if you try to apply the characteristics that we have just mentioned to him, maybe you've, you can find some uh, things that really apply to him. He's, he's considered to be a good example of such a hero. However, many literary scholars and uh, historians also point to Lord Byron himself. He is the first, actually, and, and I believe this is right, that Lord Byron himself was the first truly Byronic hero, because if we go and read about his life, we will see that he has actually took everything in his life to the most extreme. He was always uh, notorious for defying society. Uh, he was always not notorious for doing things which are very strange and pe people can't understand his behavior. For example, one of the things that I read about his life, uh, he used to drink uh, from skull. You know skull? Jumjuma. He used to drink. He had a skull and he used to drink from it something very strange indeed uh, and of course he had a lot of uh, relationships with women and so many many things which uh, when we consider his life we would see that he is the the ideal Byronic hero for he exemplified throughout his life the characteristics of the sort of literary hero he would make famous in his writing so he's the first one Okay, so now you have an idea about uh, the romantic hero, Byronic hero specifically. Let's have a brief idea, just a brief idea about the poem that you are going to study, which is entitled, On This Day I Complete My 36th, sorry, 36th Year. What do, we need, what do we need to know about this poem? This is an autobiographical, so this is a poem which talks about a certain part of Lord Byron's life and specifically the time he, uh, or let's say in his uh, 36th birthday, uh, which was written when he, when the poet reached th at uh, 36 years old. It was the last poem that Lord Byron wrote before he died, because I, I think after three months he died after uh, writing this poem. So he died very young. And you remember when he spoke about the younger generation of the Romantic poets, that all of them died young. He created an immensely popular hero 
You see, defiant, melancholy, haunted by secret guilt. You see, secret guilt. Why? Because you see, because his character is always defying society. He does things uh, which are considered to be wrong. So he he feels guilty, uh, and he keeps this. Uh, or, or let's say the bad actions he did as a secret he's always burdened with a, se with a secret which make, makes him or keeps him very sad all the time <clears throat> for which to many he seemed the model okay so uh, wh why is it important to re remember the the Byronic hero as we read this poem because we are going to see uh, because this poem was written a brief time before the death of the poet we will see how much his, uh, let's say, keeping uh, or let's say attachment, this attach, att attachment of the poet with this uh, ideal or this concept or idea that he created, to what extent it was the reason behind his death. Why? Because uh, one of the extreme things that Lord Byron did in his life that he, what did he do? He invested, look at this, he gave money, time, energy, and finally his life to what? To the Greek war of independence. I mean, he's an English poet. Why would he go and uh, fight in the Greek war? That orphan al harb al kanat ma bin Turkey or Yunan. He, f he fought on the side of the Greek. Why would he do such a thing? Because he was a person who f extremely followed his own ideals, his own uh, ideas and thoughts that he believed in to the extent that he was willing to, to be killed for them, to die for them. Okay, uh, and, and this took his life in an early age. See, so this is one of the things which characterizes the Byronic hero. And this is something that he uh, actually, he not only created characters in his poetry, which are like this, he himself acted like a Byronic hero. You see, so we are going to see in this poem, which is the last one, which is, speaks about death, which speaks about man's life, the significance of man's life. We are going to see all of these things, how they are related to the Byronic hero, and we will see to what extent they are related to the character of Byron himself. Okay, so uh, now I'm going to leave you with a recitation of the poem. Thank you for listening. On this day I complete my 36th year by Lord George Gordon Byron read for LibriVox.org by David Butler Tis time this heart should be unmoved, Since others it hath ceased to move. Yet, though I cannot be beloved, Still, let me love. My days are in the yellow leaf, The flowers and fruits of love are gone, The worm, the canker, and the grief Are mine alone. The fire that on my bosom preys Is lone as some volcanic isle, no torch is kindled at its blaze, a funeral pile. The hope, the fear, the jealous care, the exalted portion of the pain and power of love I cannot share, but wear the chain. But tis not thus, and tis not here, such thoughts should shake my soul, nor now, where glory decks the hero's bier, or binds his brow. The sword, the banner, and the field, glory and Greece around me see. The Spartan, born upon his shield, was not more free. Awake, not Greece, she is awake. Awake my spirit, think through whom thy lifeblood tracks its parent lake, and then strike home. Tread those reviving passions down, unworthy manhood. Unto thee indifferent should the smile or frown of beauty be. If thou regrettest thy youth, why live? The land of honorable death is here. Up to the field and give away thy breath. Seek out, less often sought than found, a soldier's grave. 
for thee the best. Then look around and choose thy ground and take thy rest. At Missalonghi, January 22nd, 1824. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.